this talk is about a proof system called Shirelli Adams, and it is about two different ways of um, generating C and F contradictions from a given combinatorial principle. Um, <clears throat> this is a paper with my supervisors, Stefan and Bonnie at Durham. And this, this talk is going to be fairly low level. I'm only going to, to sketch the, the proof at the end. Uh, I'm mostly just setting up the scene. And, and all the terms I just used to describe the title that I'm going to define. Um, so the field that we're situated in right now is, um, is propositional proof complexity. And uh, at the heart of this field, what we're interested in is the complexity of proof systems. A proof system being an algorithm that proves that a given um, SAT formula in CNF is, um, is unsatisfiable. It has no solutions. So, you know, like a, a prototypical and actually the seminal result in this field is um, this result for the so-called pigeonhole principle. Uh, the pigeonhole principle is a contradiction that, given some natural number n, says that you could fit n pigeons into n minus one holes without a collision. Um, as, a, as a CNF formula, it looks like this. It's the conjunction of all these clauses with roughly n squared variables. Um, these n squared variables are pij, where I, the, these indices are between 1 and n. And imagine pij is true if the if pigeon goes into the jth hole, and otherwise it's false. So what we ask is that for every pigeon, um, that there is some hole that the pigeon goes into. And what we also ask for is that for any two distinct pigeons and any hole, you know, at most one of those pigeons goes into the hole, but there's no there's no collision. It was proven for this a long time ago that uh, this only has exponentially sized in in n uh, resolution refutations. Resolution being a, a very popular proof system. So, uh, proof complexity theorists they they work with contradictions like these, and there's there's loads of ways to create these contradictions. You can write them down. Uh, you could just write them down, but we're going to um, to, to look at two different ways of generating them from first order formula. So we the the idea is for any given first order formula, you can produce a CNF that claims that this uh, formula has a model of size n. Um, so if this if this first order formula has no finite models, if it only has infinite models, then um, then this is always a contradiction. So, for example, this is the pigeonhole principle. You know, for every for everything in the domain, there exists something. Uh, there exists like a hole that it that it goes into, and so on and so forth. This has infinite models, but it has no finite models. Um, so, so this is this is the the idea of what we're we're going for. Um, so, how how do we generate a CNF from this thing? Well, we have to we have to a pick our variables and b eliminate these quantifiers. So, we're going to pick some natural number n. And um, we're going to create these so-called base variables. What are these? Uh, in general, the first order formula is going to be over a bunch of relations, each of their arities. So this one, there's only one relation, this p relation of arity two. But in general, there may be more relations with different arities. And uh, our base variables are somehow all of the instantiated relations. So it's it's all the relations with all the possible inputs to its arity essentially where we're drawing the inputs from n because we're we're here we're, we're, we're making a cnf again that that claims that this thing has a model of size n so these are these are our base variables that we start with and we'll create some more variables as we eliminate the quantifiers so we're going to eliminate the existential quantifiers first by essentially by introducing more relations. Um, this is this is an old idea called scholarization. And in general, if we have a formula like this, for all x there exists a y such that some first order formula holds. If this is true, then there there exists a function that points out at what this y is given x. So you know for any x we can we can produce a y such that this thing holds. Um, so we introduce the scholar function. Yeah, a, a function just being a relation of one extra coordinate. And um, we replace this with like a purely universal, for all x and y, 
Either Y is not the chosen witness for X, or if it is, this thing holds. So you can check that these, these two things are equisatisfiable. If, if one is true, then so is the other. If one, you know, if one, if one has a model, then so is the other. Um, so in our CNF, we need, to, we need to insist that some witness always exists. So for every X, um, we add this thing saying that something in the domain witnesses X here. This is how we move from the you know existential to the purely universal. Um, now the universal, the universal uh, quantifiers are easier to get rid of, because if we want, for example, that for every j that this thing holds, we can just take a big conjunction. We can just take a big conjunction, and it's the same thing. So this is this is how you generate, say, the the CNF pigeonhole principle from the uh, from the first order version, and this is this is an old version that 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 has been that has been looked at a lot. Um, now we're going to introduce a, a slightly different way of doing this. Uh, first of all, you might ask, why do we need why do we need another way of doing this? Um, the main answer is just because we're interested in the complexity of things. And for example, it would be cool if, say, starting from a a first order formula, you can generate two different CNFs but prove that so long as they came from the first uh, formula, say one is always harder than the other, one is always more complicated to refute than the other. Then you get a whole bunch of bounds for free, and it may be easier to prove uh, upper or lower bounds for one type versus the other, and um, you get some other bound that way. So that would be cool. Um, another reason is that this method generates some some wide clauses. We have this, big, uh, we have this very big uh, disjunction here over the entire domain. And usually that's fine, um, but we may be, you know, we have to pick our complexity measure. And some people are interested in um, the width of a clause that a proof system has to move through in order to refute something. So if we already start off with very wide clauses, then that then there's not there's not a lot we can do. So there are other ways to eliminate wide clauses, but you could you could just choose a different method of generating a, a CNF, which is what we're going to look at. So called binary version. The main difference between, well, the only difference between these two methods of generating CNF is how we um, eliminate these like uh, existential quantifiers. So before we create the scolum function, but instead what we're going to do is create some variables, create log n of them for each um, input to the function. The idea being that these things, these uh, binary W variables are going to be given some, you know, one or zero assignment and no matter what assignment that you, you give it, it's going to point somewhere in N. Um, so we're going to use this. So before the the, the scolum function would, would give you the Y that witnesses X, but here the the witness the uh, the witness Y is just gonna be pointed out by by these things holding the binary encoding of Y, essentially. So this is what we do. Um, I, I would I would I would unpack this in detail and just say what it's doing. Um, we say that okay for every y in the domain, either y is not the proposed witness, which is the same as saying that whatever binary assignment you give this thing doesn't match up with y, or if it is y, if y is the proposed witness, then you need to have this thing holding because that's what it means for y to be the witness. So those are those are two different CNFs you can generate from the same from the same um, for the same first order formula. Now we're going to turn our attention to the proof system at hand, which is Shirley Adams. So Shirley Adams, I, I just called it a proof system, but it's a little bit more general. Instead of um, proving unsatisfiability of CNFs, what it actually does is prove unsatisfiability of um, binary integer linear programs. Uh, but this is the same because this is extremely well known transformation to, from a CNF to a, a binary linear program. Um, you know, given given any any CNF, any conjunction of, of clauses, you can produce a set of inequalities such that um, these linear inequalities are satisfiable in zero and one if and only if the CNF was satisfiable. So proof theorists, they, 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 well, proof complexity theorists, they, they 
that quite often are actually looking at algorithms that, like geometric or algebraic algorithms that prove emptiness of polytopes or things more general than polytopes. Uh, because it amount because because it, it's the same thing. You can use these things to um, to prove and satisfy ability of a CNF. So this is what we're working here with. So I guess what I'm saying is we're just working with binary uh, linear inequalities. And uh, one one algorithm to attack these things is the Shirley Adams hierarchy. I say it's a hierarchy because it's parameterized by some rank. Um, you you choose a rank, and there's a trade off. The higher the rank. The higher the rank, the um, the more things that this thing can refute. The more the more polytopes it can prove empty. But the trade-off is that it takes takes more time to do so. Um, it actually increases the the uh, the running time of Australia increases quite quickly with the rank, because what it does is if you give it, if you give it a um, binary linear program with a set of over a set of variables v, it generates a linear program over the variables, um, essentially over the subsets of V of size at most K. So this, this grows quickly with K. And why does it do this? What is it trying to do? Um, it, 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 it's a linear program over these subsets and it adds constraints that try and make these subsets behave as if they were the product of the binary variables in V. So we try and kind of hack in some non-linearity and of course we can't succeed, but we can get somewhere. So what do these constraints look like that make uh, the subsets behave as if they were the product of the, of the variables concerned? It's the, these ones. So if we have a product of binary variables, the product is going to be 0 or 1. So in particular, this, it's in between 0 and 1. Then we have this kind of monotonicity. If we, if we have a product of variables and we multiply it by another variable, um, we're multiplying it by one or zero, so it's either the same or it 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 it, it falls to zero. Either way, you get the sort of monotonicity. Um, bigger subsets have to have smaller values. And finally, this is where the constraint comes in. If we have a linear inequality like this over the the binary the binary variables of the original program, then you know, if if something satisfies this thing here, if some binary setting satisfies this inequality, then if you multiply that in the, this this thing by any product of more variables, uh, it'll still hold because again we're multiplying it by zero or one. So we can we can translate this into another constraint wherever all the variables exist because we're restricting ourselves to subsets of size at most k. And it just it just looks like this. You you just get you just get constraint over these y subset variables. So Shirelli Adams refutation then is um, we have these we have these uh, all of these constraints at our disposal and we take a non-negative combination of them and make it formally sum to minus one. If, if we can do this, then we've shown that for sure that these that the original program wasn't satisfiable. Because if it was satisfiable, you could plug into these y variables the values of like actual products from some from some solution. And um, <clears throat> this left-hand side will be non-negative. It certainly is it's never going to be minus one. This means it is a, a sound proof system. So these are the principles that uh, we considered. These are the principles that we considered in the um, in the paper. The pigeonhole principle we've met. The least number principle is a is a similar idea. It claims that there is a to total ordering of n elements. Um, such that for any of those n elements, you can find something smaller. Uh, so this is a contradiction, and it's 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 well studied in the in the literature. And what are our results? Well, I said earlier it would be cool if, for example, we could say the binary the binary version of the CNF is always harder in terms of size or rank than the uh, than its unary or classical equivalent. But this isn't the case because of the following the following results. Um, the binary encoding of the pigeonhole principle is easier than the unary one, in a way. They both require large rank. You both, you, in in both cases, you need to big sets in order to refute the thing. However, the the unary pigeonhole principle it it only needs polynomial size. It only needs a poly polynomial number of um, uh, constraints or non-zero non-zero terms in order to refute it. However, the uh, the binary encoding requires exponential size, and we show this 
uh, with a random restriction argument. So, the, so basically, the binary version is hard, of the pigeonhole principle is harder than the unit one, but the least number principle is different because the least number principle requires it doesn't need a lot of rank; it needs only logarithmic and n rank and um, a small size. However, its unit version requires linear rank. This is shown elsewhere. Uh, so the, the least number of principle, its binary encoding is is easier than the uh, the unary one. Um, we prove some other results. We prove uh, for 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 a slight strengthening of the Shirley Adams and uh, a modification of the binarization this binarization procedure. But I, I won't go into it in this talk. So I'll indicate quickly how we how you get a size lower bound for for the pigeonhole principle. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a random restriction. It's a, it's a random restriction. So first of all, we 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 give a a sort of rank lower bound. We say that um, if you have a pigeonhole principle from m pigeons to h holes, there has to be a um, a set there that's used that's that has at least h pigeons, uh, as many pigeons as holes, involved in it. And then the restriction we consider is you go for the the pigeons one by one. And uh, with probability of four, we, we, we send that pigeon to a hole and then reduce the size of the pigeonhole principle by getting rid of a pigeon in a hole this way. Um, so because of the nature of this restriction, you know, with high probability, we're close to the expected number of variables set. So just uh, guess, one or two more minutes. I will be, yes, I'll be less than a minute. I'm almost there. So um, we, we end up with a, a, a refutation of this um, pigeonhole principle here, but the free card is n rather than n. But we still have this result that says that this refutation must have a term of size at, at least three quarters of n. Whether we show that it it it, it doesn't because um, at least le unless the original thing was exponentially sized, uh, because any, these big terms that mention a lot of pigeons uh, with high probability, they're made irrelevant by the restriction. So unless there's a, a lot of them, if there's less than exponentially many, and of course I'm waving my hands, then um, there is a restriction that kills all of the wide, these wide um, terms, but still refutes the pigeonhole principle of size, you know, three quarters n, which is a contradiction. And um, yes, I'll I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>